Hello, everyone. I hope you can, uh, you can hear me. My name is Joel Westfall. I am the Deputy Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, as well as the Chairman of the Greatest Generation Day Committee in Grand Rapids. Uh, we hope uh, that you enjoyed uh, the program yesterday, first day of our program, which was the in, -memor which was the in memoriam event the in memoriam event uh, on the uh, those who perished during the Second World War, not only from the United States, but from uh, but globally as well. Um, would like to thank the community. We had 16,000 people watching live uh, yesterday, and we were exceptionally, exceptionally happy with that. Before we get to our main event tonight uh, with Mr. Wallace and Countdown 1945, we do have a short video of four short stories uh, told by our greatest generation. Hope you enjoy them. And we went to our tents and everybody running around the camp and uh, somebody was hollering that Japan, uh, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. Uh, we got into our tent. The cots were gone. There wasn't no TV or anything. Everything we heard was over the radio. Uh, and then when President Roosevelt got on and next day and he declared war on Japan, uh, we knew we weren't going to go to Europe. But then again, we didn't know where we were going. When we were in Brisbane, all we had was uh, some of the uh, remarks that the Australians came in and told us about, uh, and they tried to, they, they stressed that uh, Japanese are cunning. As we were getting off the ship was, uh, there were a couple of bombers that were up in the sky. There was a clearing, and when we got out of this clearing, we walked into the jungle, or, and we followed this path, and then that's when all hell broke loose. That's when we knew we were in big trouble. Uh, some of the guys that walked in there never knew what hit them. Uh, we weren't in there maybe three, four minutes, and we lost quite a few guys. They knew I was alive because I called home from San Francisco. When I, when I left Indianapolis on a train, it was day coach, and we were pulling into the Union Depot in Grand Rapids. And I knew that nobody was going to be at the depot for me because my daddy was working in a furniture factory. My mom was home. I jumped off this side and I walked over Fulton Street Bridge. I walked up Fulton Street and I just kind of took my time. I looked around, cried, and I got home. And when my ma saw me, she cried, I cried. That was about it. Jack Carl Hill, East Grand Rapids. From the north coast of Australia, from there you went to, what was it, it was Buna, was it, or New Guinea. Yeah, and the Japs used to come over the plains at night and uh, they were trying to bomb us at the airport. We were up against the uh, 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 Japanese Imperial 18th, I think it was the 18th Army. And they had come all the way from, they went through China, Japan, or and all the way uh, India, down through that Burma, into the Philippines. All of a sudden, I look up and here comes a young Jap bomber right over the stack. With the bomb, I looked up and there's a bomb day, doors open. And that bomb, I just see that damn bomb. And I thought to myself, this is the way I'm going to get it on the way home. One of the other guys got on the other gun. They were 50 caliber. And we know how to work them. And we had both of those guns. Every damn bullet going right up, but dead head right on you. And I'll bet it wasn't 200 yards away from us. I kept thinking, what the hell is keeping him up? 
he's going to end up hitting us. And all of a sudden, <laughs> we blew him up. Is that a dream? I dream a lot of it about it. But the guy's getting killed. Uh, uh, they're not good ones, they're bad ones. You wake up and you're still sweating. But uh, and after that's after 60 some years. So you never forget that. It's like a, a photograph back there. Well, I was born in 1924 in Racine, Wisconsin. Uh, I was the, uh, the middle child of seven children. Uh, I decided to apply for the aviation cadets uh, on D-Day. We, we dropped, supposedly, the way planned from the shoreline in. And they strung out the bombs as, right. as they went in. And we were one of the last groups bombing on D-Day. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like uh, 20 minutes or so before the, the troops are supposed to hit the shore. Mm -hmm. So we were just in front of the troops. And when I first got there, I flew 13 missions in 18 days. Mm -hmm. And um, you get kind of worn out after right. that. <laughs> and, um, and then for the next, and then I lost my crew. There was, there was a um, navigator who had one mission left mm -hmm. on his tour, and then he could go home, right. stop flying combat right. right now. And he wanted to take my place, so uh, that was fine mm -hmm. uh, as far as I was concerned. I just wanted a day to sleep. I was just really exhausted. And uh, so he took my place, and... There was one plane that didn't come back that day, and that was that was my, my plane that I mm -hmm. was supposed to be on. My hands up in the air like this, and the gun in back of me with him, and we're walking through this rubble, and stuff, and, and the people are running in and out of buildings and. And I thought, oh, oh, this is probably the end of me. All of the Germans left. They all left the camp. Mm -hmm. No more guards, no more nothing. Our Air Force came in and flew us out. Then they took us then to, a, to France to a camp called Camp Lucky Strike. Mm -hmm. I was born in uh, San Antonio, Texas on February 28th, 1922. Okay. Uh, we arrived in uh, Liverpool, England mm -hmm. on May 15th of uh, 44. Right. I had gone from uh, the infantry at Fort Sam Houston mm -hmm. to Dodfield Air Force, right. to Kelly Air Force, then the Air Corps. Mm -hmm. uh, now I'm getting into the Signal Corps. Right. We were the communication for uh, Schaefer, mm -hmm. for uh, the 9th Air Force, or when they got us together there at that uh, Hedgerow country. Mm -hmm. Uh, we were instructed right there. It says you are not to take any top secret, any secret, any uh, confidential, restricted, no messages mm -hmm. except red line and urgent red line. Mm -hmm. uh, I looked down. I saw the shiny boots, mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, they were riding boots. Mm -hmm. And we're not in a place where anybody's got shiny anything there. Yes. And I thought, oh my! I don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. So I, I wasn't looking up at him. But I, as I turned around, then he gave me his uh, uh, word to call. On mm -hmm. that. So I kept hitting the K, and I then I put on, on the on the uh, on the teletype. I said, uh, General Patton here, I have a message for you. He <laughs> comes back. He's sitting right back of me right here, mm -hmm. and you can read what's going on. What comes back is this, no shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so then. I hit the K again, and I tell him, and I tell him again, a message here from General Patton. Mm -hmm. You come back with the same thing. Oh shit! Mm -hmm. <laughs> and General Patton says, and I looked around. Of course, you could see this uh, ivory pistols, and mm -hmm. I mean, he was in like he was going to be on a parade right. on that. But he always was mm -hmm. immaculate. I mean, for his role in what right. he was head of the army, third army, mm -hmm. right? Right. 
So he said, and his voice was so soft. That's what I remember. I mean, very, mm -hmm. uh, very much in control. He mm -hmm. knew what he was doing. Mm -hmm. He was talking very softly, like a person was really practice speaking and right. sucking your stomach and all yep. this stuff. Yep. He just saw him. Says, uh, "Let me, let me try it." <laughs> I stepped out, and he, I didn't know he could type or anything. Mm -hmm. But he starts typing, and uh, I don't know what he said because I wish I had kept it. Mm -hmm. But uh, what came back was, "Yes, sir." <laughs> <laughs> I was discharged in December '45. So okay. I played before now. Uh, all the time that I was there, uh, I was in a combat zone. So mm -hmm. were the other guys. Uh, I had my own business before I went into service, and I wanted to get back to work. I had people working for me uh, before I came out of high school. But mm -hmm. that was not unusual in our family. I mean, we're working and studying and that. So, but I wanted to get back to do something else. Uh, I wanted more studies. Mm -hmm. I had been to the, you know, Oklahoma and M, Bradley, mm -hmm. uh, LSU, and so right. on. But so I know that as soon as it was over, I thought, no, I'm mm -hmm. fortunate to have gotten through all this stuff. Born in Saginaw, Michigan, and uh, I'm a first-generation American, a son of uh, Russian immigrants, and it was uh, SS Santa Rosa was the ship that we went on, and uh, it was uh, in the peacetime. It was a passenger freight ship between South America and and Newport News. Well, we landed at Naples, Italy. I had 14 missions, and of those 14 missions, I had uh, three doubles. Any mission to Germany, you got credit for two, two mm -hmm. missions. And I looked down, and I see some movement down there, down below the tree. There's a Hungarian soldier down there, and he raised up his gun, and he took a shot at me. And uh, anyway, uh, I gave up. <laughs> The next day, they, t they put us on a bus and they took us to the Budapest prison. And we went into the prison and we all, were all put in solitary confinement. And I was in there for five days. It was uh, December, the Russians made a, a big drive into Germany, into Silesia, mm -hmm. is where they started. Anyway, they start working up to Pomerania, which is where we were. Right. right the commandant comes in with, a, with this green hornet who speaks English. And he says, uh, get ready to, we've got orders to evacuate the camp. So anyway, we got near America, and I see this bellboy, and it's all fog, bellboy going mm -hmm. back and forth. I thought, boy, we're, we're near America, but we've got to go so slow because of the fog. It's going to be hours before we get there. And uh, anyway, I went downstairs, and a little while later, Red was one of my partners there. Mm -hmm. He comes down, and he says, oh, quick, come up on deck. I get up on deck, and here we're in New York Harbor. I can see Statue of Liberty right. over here, Ellis Island over here, Brooklyn over here, and there's a big sign on, on Brooklyn that says, Welcome home, well done. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then there was a ship all full of girls with a, with a band. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you, I cry any time I talk about this. <laughs> anyway, that was our greeting in New York. Uh -huh. It was great. I had always wanted to find a key moment in history and do a deep dive into all of the decisions that were made, all of the characters who played a part, but, but what key moment? In early 2019, Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker of the House, invited several reporters over for a briefing in her hideaway, and she said, this is the room where Harry Truman got a call on April 12, 1945, telling him to come right to the White House. Jesus Christ and General Jackson, she said, Truman had exclaimed, and it turned out that was the day that FDR died and Truman became president. And suddenly I thought, that's the key moment. Truman becomes president and 116 days later, he drops the bomb on Hiroshima. There was a lot of research into these 116 days. I first went to the Truman Library uh, and found a lot of information, but the real treasure trove were the letters that Truman wrote to his wife Bess, to his daughter, to his mother and sister, in which he described what he was feeling, what he was experiencing at the time he was making this enormous decision. He also kept 
a very good diary, and especially when he got to Potsdam and was holding the, the summit with Churchill and Stalin, he wrote about a lot of the stress he was feeling about making this enormous decision whether or not to drop the first atom bomb. There were all kinds of surprises that we discovered in our research. I, I think one of the big ones was the fact that Harry Truman had been vice president for three months but when he becomes president on April 12th, he doesn't know anything about the Manhattan Project. He doesn't know anything about the atom bomb. The Secretary of War, Henry Stimson, takes him aside that day just moments after he's been sworn in as president and tells him about this existence of this extraordinary new weapon. Doesn't tell him any more for 12 days. My favorite character is Hideko Tomura, who was just 10 years old and on the ground in Hiroshima when the bomb dropped, most of her family was either killed or just paralyzed by the shock. She left the house by herself, remembered what her mother had told her because they were doing a lot of bombings, not of atom bombs, but regular bombs across Japan. And she had been told first, if there's an explosion, hang on to something to make sure that the house doesn't collapse on you and then immediately leave the house and head to the river, the Ota River in Hiroshima, so you can avoid any fire. And she did that. What I especially was fascinated about Hideko Tomura, she's still alive 75 years later, and I got to meet her. And I even took her out because she wanted to see it to the Air and Space Museum to see the Enola Gay, the bomber, the B-29, that dropped the atom bomb on Hiroshima. And to see her for the first time, the weapon of destruction, that killed her mother, that destroyed her family, that destroyed her city, was a deeply emotional and moving experience. What can we still learn 75 years later from Hiroshima? Well, I keep thinking back, I covered Ronald Reagan for six years in the White House, and there was something that he used to say during the height of the Cold War, when he was facing down the Soviets, and we had weapons pointed at them, and they had weapons pointed at us, Reagan used to say, a nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. And if there's one thing you take away from the, these 116 days from countdown 1945, it is that there have only been two bombs that were dropped within days of each other in Japan in 1945, first on Hiroshima, then on Nagasaki. We are still paying a price for that in terms of, of the tremendous human damage, in terms of the moral arguments three quarters of a century later, Reagan was right. A nuclear war can never be won and must never be fought. Good evening. I'm Gleaves Whitney, Executive Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation. And it's a delight to have the opportunity to welcome Chris to our Greatest Generation viewing audience. I emphasize the word welcome because Chris Wallace needs no introduction. If you were paying attention to your news feed this afternoon, you learned, as did I, that the Fox News Sunday anchor has been selected to moderate the first presidential debate between President Trump and former Vice President Joe Biden on September 29th in Cleveland. It's a well-deserved honor. Chris Wallace is arguably America's top television journalist because of his tough reporting and his no-nonsense interviews. Irrespective of an individual's party performance or personality, he plays no favorites. He fulfills the journalist's duty to stand in for us and put the tough questions to our representatives when we the people cannot. Add to these accolades, Chris's ability to write a first-rate historical work with the journalist's eye for the telling detail, as well as his perfect pacing in a world with a short attention span. I hope you've had the opportunity at least to start reading his number one bestseller called Countdown 1945, to which he just referred, a taut nonfiction thriller about some of the most important months in U.S. history. It has garnered high praise from high places. In the New York Times Book Review, for example, Jay Winnick writes, quote, it's a superb masterly book that reads like a riveting novel as Wallace reveals the machinations and internal debates among the scientific community to devise a workable atomic bomb as quickly as possible. But Countdown 1945 is also a profound story of decision-making at the highest levels and of pathos." Close quote. Friends, Americans, countrymen, lend your ears to Chris Wallace. 
Wow, I think I should quit here. It's only downhill from here. Thank you for that lovely uh, introduction. I'm so honored to be part of Greatest Generation Day uh, as part of the Ford Library. You know, it, it has become a, a cliche ever since uh, Tom Brokaw wrote his wonderful book uh, about the greatest generation. Uh, but I have to say that, that as I delved into the story of 1945, my admiration for this generation, the sacrifice that they made, and it wasn't just the men on, on the front lines, it was the women at home, it was the women who were part of the, of the Manhattan Project, because there were a number of scientists who were women. Um, it, it was, you know, it's interesting. People have said, what, what was uh, the, the, fun, the most fun of, of writing this book, or what was the pleasure of writing this book? And I think it was that to, to take time off of being on the front lines of covering uh, Donald Trump and American politics today, to go back to 1945, a time when there wasn't polarization, when you could have the Manhattan Project, 125,000 people working on it in cities across America, from Oak Ridge, Tennessee, to Los Alamos, New Mexico, to Hanford, Washington, of course, Washington, D.C., Wendover, Utah, and not a single detail, not a single word of the Manhattan Project ever leaked. And I thought, think today, if you had a secret project to develop a new apple pie recipe within two days on social media, somebody would come out and say, you know, I'm in the whistleblower and this is outrageous. And it, we, we're, I think the thing that distinguishes that generation and that period in America's history is the fact that we were all in it together. Everybody wa just wanted to do their part to defeat the enemy and win the war. And whether they were on the front lines, whether they were uh, here on the home front, uh, everybody was willing to sacrifice whatever they had to for what the better part of four years to 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 do just that to win the war. Um, just a little bit of background, and then I'd be happy to answer your questions. As I said in that that little uh, clip that ran, I'd always wanted to do a deep dive into a pivotal moment in history, and and by that what I mean is that that you know so much of history is written. Well, we know what happened here's why it happened or how it happened. But, you know, it always strikes me that the people who are living through that history don't know what's gonna happen. And they have to face these terrible uh, situations. They have to make these, these uh, enormously consequential decisions without knowing what's on the other side. And whether it was uh, Harry Truman and his war cabinet uh, in Washington and then later in Potsdam for the first big three summit post-war with Churchill and Stalin, deciding whether or not to drop the bomb, whether it was the scientists at Los Alamos, who, who when Truman took over in April uh, of 45, were still three months away from knowing whether the gadget, as they called it, the first atom bomb would even work. The first test was not until July 16th of 1945 uh, at Alamogordo or the flight crew uh, of the Enola Gay the, from the 509th Composite Group, who had no idea when they took off for Hiroshima on August 6th, what the impact, because it had only been this one test and it had been on a tower stationary in a completely deserted desert area in New Mexico. So they had no idea when they dropped the bomb, one, whether it would work in, in wartime conditions, and then two, if it did work, whether the aftershocks of the explosion would knock them right out of the sky. So, so that was what fascinated me, the idea of, of these humans, you know, now they may seem larger than life, but then they were very much, you know, uh, sharing all the fears, all the vulnerabilities, all the doubts that all of us feel today um, in this, maybe having to make an, uh, the, most, the toughest decision any president's ever had to make and part of the one of the most consequential projects that that Americans have ever devoted themselves to, just to give you a sense of that very first day, April twelfth, as I, I pointed out, Nancy Pelosi uh, gave, gave me the idea. She was, it was funny. It was it was the day of the State of the Union, and she was giving what's called a pre bottle, which is a uniquely Washington event where before the president gives the State of the Union, the speaker. And this is true of both parties. If there's a Democratic president and a Republican speaker, 
or a Republican president and a Democratic speaker, they give a pre buttle They invite some, some reporters over to say everything that's wrong with the president's speech before he even gives it. And she told this anecdote about Harry Truman being in this room and getting the phone call and going, hanging up the phone and going, Jesus Christ and General Jackson. Well, he didn't know. He was just told, get to the White House as quickly and quietly as you can. He didn't know why. And in fact, he thought he'd been vice president for 82 days. And he thought that Roosevelt, who had just come back from Yalta and was quite sick and quite exhausted and had gone to, to warm springs to try to recuperate, had somehow come back to Washington and wanted to see him. And to give you a sense of how uh, marginalized Truman was, although he'd been president, vice president for 82 days, he had only met with Roosevelt twice in those three months. And as I say, had never been told a single word about the Manhattan Project. So anyway, he, he literally, he didn't have a Secret Service detail with him. He runs from the, the speaker's office, the hideaway. Sam Rayburn was the speaker then, congressman from Texas, runs by himself all the way across the Capitol, his, his shoes, uh, footsteps echoing on the marble corridors, goes to the vice president's office on the Senate side, gets his hat, gets his, his driver, and drives to uh, the White House, gets there in about 10 minutes, uh, and, and is taken, ushered upstairs, to, he thinks, to meet the president. But when he gets there, Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady, is dressed in black, and she says, Harry, the president is dead. And Truman says, Mrs. Roosevelt, is there anything I can do for you? And she says, Harry, is there anything we can do for you? Because you're the one in trouble now. So very quickly, they have to swear him in as the new president. Um, and, and the place is deserted because the president is down in Warm Springs, they think. So they have to get whoever the cabinet members are there in Washington to get to the White House. They have to summon the Chief Justice of the United States, Harlan Stone, to swear him in. They had to find a Bible. And the, for some reason, they had trouble locating a Bible in the Roosevelt White House until they found a Gideon Bible in the desk of the chief usher on the first floor of the White House. And, and he had to call his wife, his beloved wife, Bess, uh, and their 21-year-old daughter, Margaret. And they come to the White House, and they have a swearing in. And just, just to give you a sense, and these were the, why it was so fascinating to dig in and write it as a novel, although it's all very carefully researched and all completely true, is because there are all these wonderful details. So. Uh, for instance, the, the uh, Chief Justice uh, begins to give an oath and he says, do you Harry Ship Truman? I guess he'd done some research and saw that it was Harry S. Truman and thought that, uh, that the S stood for his father's family name, Ship. But in fact, as I'm sure many of you know, the S stood for nothing. And so as he said, do you Harry Ship Truman? He corrected him and said, I Harry S. Truman. And then they did the entire oath, and suddenly Stone realizes that while Truman had held the Bible in his left hand, he had put his right hand on top of the Bible. So he hadn't put his right hand up to take the oath. So they have to give him the oath a second time, like Barack Obama. He had to get two oaths. I don't know if any other presidents did. He then talks to his cabinet, tells them he wants them all to stay on to pursue the agenda that, that Franklin Roosevelt had, had put them all in to, to, to pursue. And it's just then, as everybody is leaving and Truman's about to leave and go home, that Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, 77 years old, he had worked for five presidents. Truman would be a sixth president, says, I need to speak to you privately, takes him into a room by himself and gives him his first inkling of the Manhattan Project, just says there's an immense project to develop a, a, a weapon of you know, unprecedented power, says nothing more than that, and then basically says, <laughs> you've, you've got so much to, to settle into, I'll come back when you've had a little time to, to, to acclimate, and I'll tell you about it. In fact, he doesn't tell him for 13 days until April 25th, but I don't think Truman was beating down a door to find out about this project, because he suddenly, this very marginalized vice president, 
is the president in the middle of the war, the war on Europe is still going on, and the, the war in, in, in Japan and the Pacific is, is in full fury. Uh, so he, he was perfectly willing to wait until Henry Stimson came along with Leslie Groves, the, the general who was the, the, really the director, the military director of the Manhattan Project, to brief him on the 25th of April. Anyway, with that as a brief introduction, I'd love to have a conversation. Thank you very much, Mr. Wallace. I appreciate that. Um, first of all, I want to let everybody know, if you have a question for Mr. Wallace, please make sure you type that in. We'll go to the questions in a little while. I have some, pre some prepared questions uh, first. Uh, Joel, can yes. I interrupt for one second? Yes, sir. Please stop calling me Mr. Wallace. I'm Chris. Okay. I'm Chris, Chris. You, you got it. Okay. Uh, so if you have questions for Chris, please put them in. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at those and uh, we're gonna be, we'll do some of those later on. And I do have some prepared questions. My first one is after reading the book, and I read it twice, what I, what I really liked about it was it really reads like a thriller. Like it was almost written to be um, a, almost a thriller kind of, a, almost like a movie. It reads like a movie. Was that, was that the plan when you began your research and started the writing process? No, it, you know, and it's so funny you say that, Joel, because as I was writing it, you know, this is the first time I've written a, a, a work of history. It's the first time I've written a book. And so, you know, I didn't quite know, and I have a very good co-author, Mitch Weiss, he did a lot of it too. Uh, but, I, you know, you, when you begin a project, you kind of don't know how it's going to end. I did have this sense that I wanted it to be a deep dive. I did have this idea of countdown. And, and what happens, for those who haven't read the book, is not every day, but we count down the key moments in those 116 days from when uh, Truman becomes president until the bomb is dropped on, on Hiroshima, although obviously everything doesn't happen in those 116 days. And you have to, as you know, almost like flashbacks in a movie, you have to go back and tell, well, how did Truman get there? Well, how, how did the Manhattan Project start? How did uh, Robert Oppenheimer end up as a scientific director at Los Alamos. But as I was telling the story, you know, in this countdown of the key moments in 116 days, it, it, it kind of took on a life of its own. And, and I will say, and I'm delighted that you, that you felt that way, as it was going on, I thought, my gosh, this is, and it's all true, every word of it, but it felt like, it felt to me like the screenplay for a movie or a limited TV series. And um, I will tell you that we're, I think it's gonna be made into a limited series, as a matter of fact, very good Hollywood director is interested in it. And uh, so, so I felt that too, that it, it, is, it took on a life of its own. Um, and, and, you know, there are so many wonderful details that as you begin the story, all I knew in the beginning was I wanted to do what the process was and the subject, but I didn't know until I'd done the research what the stories were. And there's so many things in, this, in the book, as you know, Joel, having read it, um, that if you were a Hollywood screenwriter, you wouldn't make up like the fact that Harry Truman sworn in as president and doesn't know about the Manhattan Project. And after he's sworn in, the, set, the grizzled old 77 year old Secretary of War comes in and tells him about it. I mean, these are things you'd think, well, that's over the top. That would never happen. It happened. Um, one of my favorite lines from your book, and this of course is because I worked at the Pentagon, was the fact that your statement saying, my job is so secret, even I do not know what I am doing. So the Manhattan Project, 125,000 people, yet maintained a secrecy for years. How did they pull that off? Well, I, I think part of it was, as I say, that, um, that, you know, everybody was on the same team. Everybody wanted to do their part. I don't, you know, I can't, I, the, the, the people, and I'm going to tell one specific story about somebody, and it involves her, where we use that line. Um, they would never have dreamt of telling anybody about it. I think another reason it was so it, the secret held is because it was very compartmentalized. Yes, there were some people, obviously the war cabinet, uh, the people at Los Alamos knew everything. But for instance, the crew of the 509th, uh, which was you know, the crew that actually flew the mission, 
until the plane took off on August 6th, only the, the pilot and the radar uh, man, Jacob Beezer and, and Paul Tibbetts, the pilot, they were the only ones who actually knew it was an atom bomb. Everybody else knew that there was this secret weapon and that it might not end the war, but might bring the war to a faster end. But everything else was so compartmentalized. And this brings me to one, one of my favorite characters in the book, and that's Ruth Sisson. Ruth Sisson was a 19-year-old girl. She lived in rural Tennessee, and she suddenly hears about this big plant uh, that, that is being built in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. And she applies for a job there and she gets a job there. And, you know, there are these signs all over the place. What you see here, what you hear here stays here. And she was one of the so-called Calatron girls. And the, and the Calatron were these giant sort of floor to ceiling machines, sort of like the early uh, Univac computers or something that filled up a room. And it had meters on it and needles and dials and all, and, and that the, the, the young women, and they were all, women, they were called the Calatron girls, all they were told is you need to keep the meter in the green. If you don't let it get to the red. If you do, you have to pull the knob this way or call a supervisor. And they would work eight hour shifts, have no idea. They knew that they had to keep the, meat, the neater, needle where it was, but they had no idea what they were doing. In fact, they were enriching uranium. They were separating U-235, the, the isotope from the, the, the raw uranium, which was the fuel from, for the atom bomb. It was in that context where, that we told this line that was used a lot, my job is so secret, I don't even know what I'm doing. And what made the story especially poignant is that she had fallen in love a couple of years before with a fellow named Lawrence Huddleston. And Lawrence Huddleston had become an army medic and had gone over to Europe and had seen some of the worst of the fighting in the European theater. Now, on May 8th, less than a month after Truman comes, becomes president, uh, the, the, the Nazis surrender. So the war in Europe is over. But the war in Japan, as I said, is raging more furiously than ever. And her great concern was that Lawrence Huddleston, who had survived the war, was now going to be shipped as were hundreds of thousands of other Americans going to be shipped from the European theater to the Pacific. And, you know, so unbeknownst to her, the Calatron machine she was working on ended up being the device that may well have saved her then boyfriend, later her husband for 40 years or something, Lawrence Huddleston, saved his life because like so many others, he didn't get shipped halfway around the world to the Pacific. Thank you. Um, I don't think you could find two people more different than General Graves and Robert Oppenheimer, yet they were able to successfully work together and complete the Manhattan Project. Um, what was the relationship like? Was there friction? And how was it ultimately successful? Well, you're exactly right. Leslie Groves, was uh, a, a bulldozer of a man, literally and figuratively. He was about six feet tall. He weighed 250 pounds. He had a thin mustache. And he was, he'd come up through the Army Corps of Engineers. And he was, you know, the kind of guy that you gave a job to. And he didn't particularly respect rank. He just was there to get the job done. To give you a sense, his uh, immediate job in 1941 and two before the Manhattan Project, was he that was the man behind building the building where you worked, the Pentagon. He was the guy, you know, who, who was in charge of building the largest structure in the world at that time, as well as an 8,000 car parking lot. Um, but then when there was decision was made in 42, we really got to get going on seeing whether we can research and develop an atomic weapon. He was put in charge of it. And he was a great engineer, can-do guy, and, and, and a general, but he obviously didn't have any of the scientific expertise. So they needed a scientific director, and they went to a, an absolutely brilliant physicist out in the West Coast uh, who taught at Berkeley and at the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena named uh, Robert Oppenheimer. And uh, absolutely brilliant guy, but not thought to be much of an administrator. And in fact, when he got the job as a scientific director uh, at Los Alamos, 
somebody said, you know, he couldn't manage a hamburger stand. But as sometimes you don't know whether the event, uh, you know, creates the summons the man to greatness or the, the man has it in him already. He became a great administrator. They had 8,000 people in a very, very high security barbed wire, you know, multiple fences uh, area of, of Los Alamos, including, I think there was a half dozen Nobel Prize laureates, and he made it work. And one of the interesting things that they had to do was he was, not only did he keep them going, but he was kind of the shock absorber between Groves and the scientists because Groves was constantly pushing, we gotta meet this deadline. And of course, science doesn't always meet a deadline. And, but Groves didn't care because he had a war to win. So Oppenheimer was the guy who took a lot of the heaviest blows from Groves and shielded his, uh, you know, his scientists who, who Groves considered a bunch of prima donnas uh, from, from you know, the full furnace blast of Groves' personality. And in fact, in the book, we have a letter that uh, FDR, I think it's in 43, 44, writes, 43, writes to uh, uh, Oppenheimer, basically thanking him for keeping the train on the track and you know, negotiating between the military demands and the realities of scientific discovery. Thank you. Um, so the question, whether it was right to drop the bomb, bombs at all, is I think it's just a question that's been asked quite a bit over the last, quite a last few decades. So I'm going to ask it kind of from a little bit of a different perspective. Um, so we know that, for example, half the population, civilian population of Okinawa died during the invasion of Okinawa. And also we know that had Operation Downfall been exercised in late 1945, you know, there are estimates that combined with Operation Coronet and Operation Olympic uh, that we're talking perhaps 300,000 Americans, some people said more. Um, but also there was the belief that perhaps a million to two million Japanese would have died in any invasion. So my, my question is this, is is we, we know that Truman thought about the American casualties and saving them. Did he ever think about saving the Japanese lives and, and what it would cost the Japanese uh, if in, in a land invasion? Well, uh, that certainly entered his thinking, but it certainly was not his prime consideration. You know, like everybody else over the decades, and I, you know, I knew kind of what I think most people know about Hiroshima and, and that decision which is a little bit, but not a lot. And, and it had never really occurred to me until I started researching the book that the decision that Truman had to make was not drop the bomb or don't drop the bomb. It was drop the bomb or invade. And you know, you talk about all those code names of those operations you're talking about. Those were the various code names for first uh, invading Kyushu, the southernmost island, and then Honshu and, and taking on all of, uh, of, of Japan. And in April, no, um, forgive me, in June of, of 45, uh, he meets with his war cabinet, Truman does, at the White House. And you know there are all these giants of mid 20th century America there, Henry Stimson, the Secretary of War, General of the Army, George Marshall, a number of other people. And Marshall has the projection at that point for what it's gonna take. And he says, uh, it, it, it's going to take, I, I, this number sticks in my head because I, I don't quite understand, <laughs> this was the number, I don't quite understand how he came to such a precise number. Marshall said it would take 766,700 troops. That's exactly how many troops he said he was going to need. And the projection was exactly as you say, it was going to be a million Japanese casualties, anywhere from a quarter of a million to a half a million uh, American casualties and the war. Now remember, he, we're, we're now in June of 45. The bomb is dropped in April, of, I mean, in August of 45. The projection was the war would go on if you did an invasion, was gonna go on till November of 46. So we were gonna talk, we're talking about another year and a half 
of, of warfare was the best estimate how long it would take because the, the Japanese, you talk about Okinawa, the, the, the projection had been that it would take uh, less than a week to subjugate Okinawa. It took three months and they killed 100,000 Japanese soldiers and not a single Japanese soldier surrendered. So many of them committed suicide rather than to surrender. Um, so there was no give in the, in, in the Japanese. And in terms of his calculation, you know, all I know is what he wrote to his family and especially what he wrote in his diary. And once he knew that the bomb worked, which he found out when they had the test on July 16th. And he's in Potsdam. He writes in his diary, I think the flower of American youth is worth a couple of Jap cities. That's what he wrote. And so, you know, I, I'm sure that he certainly understood that it was going to be horrific for the Japanese. Listen, we had had firebombing, conventional firebombings by General LeMay of Tokyo that had killed 100,000 people in a single night. So he certainly knew that it was going to be a bloodbath for the Japanese. But, you know, to the degree that that was a real consideration, I, I don't see any indication of it in his contemporaneous diaries or letters. What he was very concerned about was saving American lives. And, you know, people ask, have asked me about this, and, and I don't weigh in on the book about whether or not it was the right thing to do or the wrong thing to do. I basically think that that he had no other choice as a practical matter. Although interestingly enough, on uh, July 20th, he has lunch with Supreme Commander Dwight Eisenhower and, and Omar Bradley at Potsdam. And Eisenhower says, and continued to say for the rest of his life, he wouldn't have dropped the bomb. But I will say that, that I don't see how Truman had any other choice because think if he had not decided not to drop the bomb and he goes ahead and ships Lawrence Huddleston and all those other Americans over and, and to, to the Pacific and they get involved in this huge bloodbath and you know tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of Americans die and it goes on for a year. And at some point people discover, well, he had a secret weapon that could have ended the war like that. How could any president you know, stand that judgment I, I don't understand. I, you know, I just don't see how anybody could have could have said, well, I just decided I didn't want to do it. Uh, my last question will uh, and then we'll go to the, uh, the Q&A. Um, so today is September 2nd, 75th anniversary. Um, we had had a, we've had a couple of uh, great events here in the city of Grand Rapids uh, as well, including a flyover. Um, my question is, is how does countdown 1945 tie into the generation? You touched on this earlier on. Uh, how does Countdown 945 tie into the generation of Americans and what they accomplished? Well, you know, I just think it's, it's uh, I hope, if people, if people read it, that it, they will, it will take them back in time to a very different America, an America where, where sacrifice, country, uh, uh, victory, pulling together all came first and um, considerations of self or party or ideology just you know weren't, weren't, weren't part of anybody's uh, of anybody's reasoning of anybody's uh, calculation um, you know and I and writing the book researching it writing it talking about it to folks um, I you know I come away with a conclusion boy, could we use some of those same qualities today. Um, that sense of unity of a country pulling together. Um, you know, it really, one of the things that's been most wonderful in seeing those great videos of those, of those uh, veterans of, the, of World War II, you know, while it's history, and, and to some of us who didn't live through it, it's ancient history, I suppose, we're really only one generation removed. And I can't tell you how many people I've heard from a very few who actually still are survivors of that period and we're, we're in World War II, but an awful lot of people who have written to me telling me that their dad was one of those people who was going to be shipped over 
uh, to the Pacific or already was there and had been told to prepare for the invasion and how, you know, you know how they wouldn't be sitting there on the other end of the Zoom Great call if, uh, if it hadn't been for Truman's decision that their dad might well have, have, have perished in that bloodbath of the, uh, of the invasion. So, so, you know, this is, we're only one generation removed from this. And, you know, boy, if there's anything that should make you feel gratitude to the generation and honor, whether you agree with it or not, to the decision that Harry Truman made, because it affects people like yourself, uh, your existence, um, I think it's this story. Thank you. First question we have from Rick here is, after the bombs were dropped, uh, did Truman ever have doubts about his decision? No. I mean, if he did, he confessed it to his wife, Bess, and to nobody else. Uh, and I don't think he did that because he was asked, as you would expect, over and over again for the rest of his life, in his presidency, in his post-presidency, and he lived for 20 years after he left office. Uh, he was even asked about it by Alden Whitman, who was the, the famous obituary writer for the New York Times for an article that would be printed after his death. It would be his obituary. And so it was all, you know, something that he would never have to live with. Um, and he always said it was the right decision to make. I, I, I was tough. I understood the consequences. But it was, you know, and, and you have to understand also. Uh, this was the end of uh, a war that had begun with, with Pearl Harbor, a war that had been filled with images and stories of Japanese, I mean, of American prisoners of war who'd been taken prisoner and had been beheaded or, or tortured or brutalized by the Japanese. Um, when he dropped the bomb, the, the approval rate, and there was a Gallup poll, yes, they had polls back in 45, a Gallup poll showed, I think, 85% support for the decision. Truman was asked about it over and over again, never had any second thought. I will tell one quick story. I'm sorry to go on a little bit, but this is, this is another one of these stories that you couldn't have made up. So it's October of 45. It's, what, three months after the bomb. And Oppenheimer goes to meet with Truman in the Oval Office. And by this point, three months later, Oppenheimer, who was, as I say, the brains, the mastermind behind the atomic bomb, has suddenly had terrible second thoughts. And he goes in to meet with Truman and he says, Mr. President, I feel that I have blood on my hands. And Truman says, Dr. Oppenheimer, I'm the one who gave the order. Don't worry about it. I have blood on my hands. And he gets Oppenheimer out of there as quickly as he can. And then he says to one of his aides, and I never want to see that son of a bitch in this office ever again. <laughs> so. That's so much for Truman and his second thoughts. So we know that Truman didn't have second thoughts. And this next question comes from Andy, is that did Bess Truman ever heard, express her thoughts on her husband dropping the bomb or any member of the family? You know, I don't know. That's a very good question, Andy. Now make me feel like a dope. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would very much tend to doubt it, but I, I can't authoritatively say. It's not something I looked into. I just, I'd be surprised that she would ever say that, given the fact that her husband was so steadfast in his, his resolve that this was the right thing to do to protect American soldiers. I can't imagine Bess would ever have, have uh, broken with him on that. It's, it's, and I'm sure a lot of you know that. She was called the boss, and he called her the boss. And uh, he, you know, she was kind of the boss in the, in the family. And there's a wonderful story we have in the book where um, she's sitting with a friend and Harry Truman is giving a speech and uh, he keeps talking about manure and uh, the woman turns to Bess, you know where I'm headed, and the woman turns to Bess and says, you know, I love his speech, but I just wish he'd stop using the word manure. And she says, listen, you know how long it took me to get him to say manure? <laughs> So they were a team. Um, I like this next question, and I'm going to ask it from a little bit of different. The question is, when researching for this book, what surprised you the most? I like that, but I'm going to add on to that because I'm an archivist, and I love, I love to hear about the, re the research, how the research was conducted. So I'm going to combine those two. What did, what did you like? What was your favorite thing about surprised you the most? And then... How did you like the research? What, what, uh, we know what got you involved in it with was Pelosi, 
but what what was the research or development like the arch working with the archivists well uh, the truman library was fascinating i had never you know i'd been to lots of uh, of uh presidential libraries i've been to the ford library and Grand Rapids, which is wonderful. Um, and, and, but I'd never been in the back, where, you know, where the records are. Interestingly enough, when I went uh, in, uh, actually, uh, you know, a little more than a year ago in the summer of, of 19, 2019, uh, to Independence, the museum was under renovation. I don't know whether it's, I don't think it's been opened yet. I think it's opening in the fall but it was completely shut down. And so I had to go in the back way and they set me up with this archivist named Randy Sowell, and who was a, a good guy, but a kind of a crusty guy. And I said to him, you know, they've obviously over the course of the last uh, 75 years, well, no, not 75 years, maybe 65 years since the library was set up, um, they've had a lot of people come and ask for information and you know, I wasn't, as you know, you're not quite sure what it is you want, but I, I knew the thing that I was really looking for was stuff that would take me, because, you know, there've been a lot of great histories written about Truman, so I knew a lot of that stuff, but I wanted something about sort of the inner conversation, you know, what was going through his mind, what was going through the letters, what was in the diary, and, and you know, the letters, he was pretty he was somewhat circumspect because he obviously couldn't, in letters that he was writing before the bomb dropped, he couldn't write top secret classified information to his wife or daughter or mother or sister back in Grandview, Missouri. But in his diary, which he took with him, he could write anything he, and he did write very detailed stuff. And I don't know whether it was, um, hazing or what, but I, I finished the first day, as I say, I'd never done this. And uh, I went back to my motel, which was a pretty crummy motel, I gotta say, in Independence. I'm not especially happy. And I had nothing. And I thought, well, this is, I hope this isn't gonna be just a complete waste of time. And I got there the next day and Randy said, well, maybe you'll find this interesting. And it was every diary notation from April 12th through August 6th, or maybe even a little bit beyond August 6th of 45. And I thought, yeah, he was just trying to give me a hard time. And now that I've come back a second day, he's gonna, he's gonna uh, you know, make it easier on the old guy. So, you know, I, and, and I, I didn't obviously have the actual diary that is all put away, but so I had copies of, of, of the stuff. And, but there were a few documents that I got my hands on that were the actual documents that had been in Truman's hands. And that's, you know, even if they weren't terribly important, those are just thrilling. You know, there's just that sense of connection. If, if you, I didn't know you were the, uh, the archivist. I mean, that sense of connection of this piece of paper has passed down through history from Truman's hands. And now I'm holding it today, 74 years later at that point. Uh, that just gave me a, a tremendous thrill. I, I know I know the feeling. Um, do you have time for two more questions, Chris? Yes, sir. All right, great. Uh, this one comes from Michael. Uh, it is, uh, do, you, do we have any indications of who decided that Truman wasn't to be informed of the Manhattan Project? Uh, the explanation of perhaps why he wasn't, um, was it feared he would be a leaker? That's a mo modern connotation. Uh, or was he just not viewed as a full partner of FDR in his first 82 days as VP? Uh, Michael, the, you, you got to it with the last part. I, I think you got to remember, this is, this is Roosevelt in his fourth term. He's had, you know, a couple of vice presidents uh, and, and he had no interest at all in who his vice president was going to be. He left it completely to the Democratic Party uh, officials. And the convention was in July of 44 in Chicago. And Henry Wallace had been the vice president up to that point. And the, the, the Robert Hannigan, who was the chair of the Democratic Party, and a, a lot of other power brokers wanted him out because they thought he was too far to the left. There was a feeling socialist, even maybe some communists around him. And although Roosevelt didn't consider this particularly, he seemed to have thought he was going to live forever. Everybody else around him was very concerned that he would not live out a fourth term. And they, they, they didn't want Wallace to succeed 
Roosevelt as president. So, and, and when they made the calculation as to who should replace Wallace and be the vice president, the decision by the party brokers was basically who will hurt the ticket the least. It wasn't, you know, who, who can step in right away. Truman was a well thought of uh, vice, I mean, a senator, but he would, but well down the list. I mean, he was, you know, he, he was not a, a serious person. I mean, uh, Jimmy Burns, the uh, senator uh, who had then been appointed to the Supreme Court, who Roosevelt had, had taken off the court, convinced him to leave the court and to run the Office of War Mobilization, a much more serious contender. And in fact, uh, Truman had gone to Chicago because he was going to deliver the nominating speech for Jimmy Burns. But the feeling was Roosevelt, uh, Truman would hurt the ticket the least, so he signs on. He is inaugurated on January 20th, and Roosevelt promptly forgets about him. I don't think it had anything to do with anything other than he just didn't, he didn't take Truman into his confidence, into his calculation. He just wasn't a player. As I say, he only met in 82 days as vice president. He only met privately with, uh, with Roosevelt twice in those days and was not part of his war cabinet or inner circle. Last question. Uh, what is your next deep dive or next project? Well, I've got one. I'm working on it now. Um, I'm going to take the month off from the project. I'm not going to tell you what it is, uh, but I've, I've started on it and I think it'll be a worthy successor and very dramatic. I say I'm going to take the next month off because as was pointed out at the beginning, I have just today gotten the assignment to moderate the first presidential debate. So I think between now and uh, Tuesday, September 29th in Cleveland, Ohio, I'm going to be a little busy. Well, I will say this, I will say this, uh, Chris, on behalf of the National Archives and Records Administration, the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum, I thank you. Uh, it was just, this was fantastic. Uh, again, I really, really enjoyed the book. I really can't wait for the movie. And I always, I will only say this. Um, about more, a little bit more about the book. And if they do turn it into a movie, I hope they turn it into a movie that is, that is just as good, that is just as good as The Day After. Because that, that, a lot of people view that was the movie that changed Ronald Reagan's mind on, on nuclear weapons. And if they can turn this book into something like that, I think that would be great going forward for humanity. I, uh, I, I, I would be very happy to have something that is serious and historically accurate. And, you know, while I've been given a, a, a consultant's role, I'll be able to read a script and say, well, that's crazy. You know, uh, Harry Truman, uh, you know, did not play the trumpet. He played the piano. Um, in the end, the director decides what the director said, but I'm sure it'll be a serious project. I want to thank all you guys. And I also want to say, to people in Grand Rapids who are logged on. I think my father's first job in radio after he graduated from the University of Michigan in 1939 was in radio in Grand Rapids. So I feel like I feel a connection. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much again for doing this. This was a great, a great talk about a great book. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. My pleasure. Thank you. Bye, everybody.